morning, Journey Church. My name is Brad. This is my wife, Michelle. I'm one of your provisional elders here at the church, and I'd like to welcome you here this morning. Uh, Pastor Carl asked us to come up and, and talk about some of the things that are going on in the church. Uh, he and several others from the church decided to go on a, on a short walk this weekend. So if, if you hadn't heard, they, uh, they went to do a charity walk to raise money for the Hope Effect, which is one of the ministries we support. Um, like I said, small walk. They went, they went up to the Grand Canyon, decided to go from one uh, rim to the other, and then go back again. So 50 miles. Thankfully, they all made it back. I, I got word from him this morning. They're all uh, on their way home, so you can be praying for them as they're driving back down. But... Uh, Good morning and welcome, and if this is your first time here, you're not here by accident. This is uh, God ordained for you to be here this morning, and we would love to show our thanks for you being here by giving you a gift. So if you go out these doors when the service is over, there's a table, and there's a bag we'd love to give you that's got a $10 gift card for Starbucks. Uh, But more important than that gift card is a little uh, card on the outside that says scan me. And when you do that, it's going to bring up on your uh, smartphone all kinds of information about the church, including a way for you to submit a prayer request, submit information about you. We'd love to be able to reach out to you and find out what brought you to Journey and hopefully connect you in with something like our small, one of our small groups, our different ministries. We just love to, to invite you to be a part of our church family. Uh, so don't, for, don't forget to do that on your way out. If you're somebody that's already a member or a regular attender for the church, if you've got prayer requests, if you want to get involved in a small group, you can also scan that code. That is our new way of scan it and find it that you can find out everything that needs to go on in the church. So with that, we've been talking the last few weeks about community, building community on Sunday mornings, just like we're doing here now, and then going outside these walls and building community as well. And what a great opportunity we have next weekend. What is next weekend? Easter. All right. And with that, we have a lot of things going on. Yep, there is a lot, actually. And don't forget, we've still got time to um, get grab our cobbler kits out front before you head out the front door um, so that you can invite some more people to come and be a part of our festivities next weekend. Um, it's a great way to just meet your neighbors if you haven't already. Um, you don't make the kit. You actually hand it to them, and it's got some invites on there for Easter Sunday as well as our block party. But I'm going to do this in time order. We actually have a worship service next uh, next Friday, Good Friday, and I hear it's amazing, and it's an opportunity to practice what we're going to do in heaven one day, right? So, like, just praising Jesus the whole time. And so I'm going to be there 7 a.m., 7 p.m., not a.m., 7 p.m. <laughs> next, this next, this coming Friday, Good Friday. And then on Sunday, it is our first Sunday of new service time. But I think they've planned it this way with breakfast before that so that you won't be late to that first service if you come to the first service. So 8.30 is breakfast. And I have it on from the cook directly. We are having eggs, pancakes, and bacon. So it is a massive breakfast. Um, and that starts at 8.30. Then our new service time is 9 and 10.30. Breakfast will be continuing through that following next service. So if you're coming to the second service, you still get to partake in breakfast. Bring your neighbors, bring your friends. Um, And then uh, the following, actually, and we're also going to have an egg hunt. I didn't want to forget that. So egg hunt. And I think that's for kids of all ages, but uh, I'm I'm assuming they're going to let anyone participate, but I'm not sure. So that should be fun. And then on the following Saturday, April 23rd, we will have that fun block party with inflatables, food trucks, games, Um, So, again, scanning the code to find out how you can be helpful with that and making it the best event possible. And I don't know the time on that, but here's my invite for you to grab invites on your chair. Find out the time of that block party. Invite your friends. Invite your community. And let's keep building community together. Thank you, guys. So as we get ready to have uh, Pastor Cam come up and share God's word with us this morning, um, I'd ask that your hearts be in prayer. And as, as God speaks to you through his word, um, if something is, is, is pulling at your heart, if you're burdened by something, everybody look back in that corner. If you don't know, that says need prayer. Um, after our services every Sunday morning, we have folks back there to pray with you. Um, don't walk that, that journey alone. It's just Journey Church. We walk it together. We want to love you, and we want to love you well. So let's go to the, to the Lord and um, prepare our hearts and minds. Father God, thank you this morning as we've uh, lifted our voices to you. And now as we prepare to lift our hearts and minds to you, 
um, to worship you in not only uh, music, but in your word and in, in Pastor Cam's teaching. So I pray that you would um, open our hearts and minds, help us to be hearers and doers. And as we are doers, we go this week, um, we have people see us differently and say, what is so different about them? And it is you, Lord, and that we would draw them to you and to Easter Sunday is that special time to remember you. In your son's name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. Yeah, what's up, guys? Yeah, that's right. All right, all right. Take it easy. Uh, anyways, hey, my name is Cam, uh, and I want to say uh, happy Palm Sunday to everyone. Um, Palm Sunday, if you guys don't know what, a couple thousand years ago, uh, everyone here welcome, uh, is, uh, is a great story in Matthew 21 where we see Jesus entering into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, and people laid palm branches at the feet. Uh, saying what? Does anyone know what it is? Hosanna, right? Uh, singing Hosanna, praising Hosanna, a declaration of saying your kingdom come, your will be done basically on here as it is in heaven. And so I just want to say next week, uh, there are uh, cards like this uh, for our pieces finale. Uh, we put the final piece together. Ah, see what I did? Uh, in uh, this series next Sunday, um, and just because it was said once doesn't mean you've heard it, okay? How many of you guys have had kids where you feel like you've said the same thing a thousand times? Uh, and it's like, I just said it, dude. Uh, and they don't, and they, well, what do we mean? Nine o'clock next week, first service starts. It is a change, half hour shift forward at both services, which means you got to get up, okay? You got to get up earlier, okay? Uh, it means uh, it's an opportunity for us to reach wider. Why? All studies show that the 9 o'clock hour and the 10.30 hour, statistically across the nation, are the hours that people are most likely to go to church. It also just allows us to be able to disperse some of the crowd in the first service and open up seats at both service to invite. Because if you come to the first service, uh, what we see is we're about 80 to 85 percent full, which is what we call critical mass. It looks full, feels full, energy is great, but when you're all standing up, if you're new to journey, you feel like you can't find a seat. Uh, and you also don't want to sit in the front row. So uh, instead of being Baptro Baptists, okay, I want you to sit up into the front next week during Easter services. Fill up the front seats first, uh, and then let our friends and families and neighbors uh, do that. Because next week we're going to have an awesome time as we celebrate Easter. Uh, I'm looking forward to the egg hunt personally. Uh, I think I can beat the third graders this year. Uh, no, I, I really love our Journey Kids. If, if you don't know, uh, Journey Kids is a great opportunity uh, because for us, it's not childcare. Uh, for us, it's not just glorified babysitting. For us here at Journey, we believe the next generation is going to change the world and make the biggest impact for Christ the world has ever seen. For me, that's just not rhetoric in which we say. I believe it's prophetic, okay? I do believe that this next generation is going to be the one that changes the world the most for the kingdom of God. And here at Journey, we don't just simply view it as babysitting, like I said. Uh, every single week, we are laying the foundations of faith in the lives of our students. Because when we know, when our kids and students believe in Jesus, they don't get a junior Holy Spirit. They get the full thing. And that's why I'm excited, because when baptisms happen next week, we got four, five, six Journey kids right now signed up to lead the way in our church uh, in baptism next week. And so be here. We're going to celebrate that in service. And I just got to say, if you see somebody with a Journey Kids shirt on, uh, if you have uh, Jen, who is our kids director's number, or you're on Facebook, friends with her, or you know her email, get it online. I just want us to flood her inbox uh, and just say thank you for leading our, our Journey kids well. So do that. And if you don't know her, um, she's one of the crazy people that walked the Grand Canyon like 40 miles in a, in a few hours. I'm like, I don't think I even drove 40 miles this past week, okay? Like, let alone walk it in a day. So praise be to he. That is not me. Amen. Amen. So <laughs> so we're going to continue in our series called Pieces. Everyone say Pieces. 
pieces. And what we're looking at is the final moments of Jesus' life and realizing that a lot of the stories of Jesus' life reflect our life. In fact, we can find ourselves in these pieces. And so in week one, we looked at Judas and Peter and how both of them failed Jesus. Both of them ran away, and but however, only one returned back. Uh, and so the question that we laid out was for you in your life, when it comes to you following Jesus, or maybe that's why you stopped following Jesus, because you failed, or because you uh, messed up, or because you, 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 know, you had uh, fallen. Uh, and so were you like Judas, who ran away from him? Or you're more like Peter, who returns back? In week two, we looked at the Pharisees uh, in the Sanhedrin, which we call, uh, well, we call the Sanhedrin, which are the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee. And so when we talk about the Sanhedrin, a lot of people are like, what is that? Well, they're two different sects of the same type of religious group. Uh, they are the Pharisees, which is the religious leaders, and they believed in the resurrection of Jesus, or, or not of Jesus, uh, of the resurrection that is to come. But then there are the Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection. So obviously they were sad, you see. Yeah. Think about that for a moment. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Glory. Glory to God. Yes. Uh, praise be. Uh, you know what? I got to repent from that joke. That's like one of the oldest, like worst jokes like a, a preacher could ever say. But, but they had to ask the question, was Jesus nothing to you? Is he a nuisance to you or is he necessary for you? And for the Sanhedrin, he was nothing in a new sense. But for Nicodemus, he was necessary. He was for their salvation, for their life. The week after that, we looked at Pilate and Herod and how following Jesus is inconvenient, but it does not mean it's inessential. Uh, it's inconvenient because Jesus is going to call you and me to do things that are inconvenient. Uh, like, hey, one what? Everything you're about, stop it. Like, Everything that you want to do, the flesh and desires that you have, carry your cross and follow me, which means, hey, walk across the street and go talk to your neighbor. Inconvenient. Uh, go and talk to your uh, coworkers about coming to church. Inconvenient. Change the lifestyle habits or the trajectory of your family. It's inconvenient. But it doesn't mean it's not inessential. It means that, well, God is calling us to a greater life. So you have to ask the question, is your relationship inconvenient or are you for it? In the last week, we looked at Jesus and Barabbas, this criminal, uh, who Jesus took his place. And so what we said was God had to treat Jesus like Barabbas in order to treat Barabbas like Jesus. That for you and I, God treated Jesus with the punishment that we deserve. But yet, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so we can have life and freedom in knowing that. And so today, we are going to look at the thieves on the cross, an incredible story uh, that I hope will bring you uh, inspiration, uh, a story that will bring you hope, and more than that, in the next 15 to 20 minutes, that as you leave here, you are ready to go do the work of Jesus. So let me pray for us, and we're going to get into it. Father, we love you. We thank you. Lord, we just pray that today is a day where uh, we begin to realize exactly how important your work is here on earth. God, we pray that today is a day where we actually turn back to you, even if we've been running for a long time or we've never turned to you, Lord, may we return. And God, may all of us, you know our names. Sitting in the seats is not something that uh, you are shocked by. You know us by name. And so, Jesus, may you speak to us clearly. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so to set the scene real quick, to help us kind of understand where we are at, if you want to go ahead and jump there, go to Luke 23 in your Bibles. We're going to be at verse 32 in a few moments. But to set the scene, I think oftentimes uh, when we read Scripture, there are small little moments that we just easily skip by. Like we forget. We don't even know the impact or really the action that was taking place. And so in Luke 23, it says that Pilate handed over Jesus to the Roman soldiers, and then he was flogged. And then it just quickly moves on. Now, flogging back in the day uh, is, well, it was incredibly painful. It was the worst, okay? Uh, because what would happen is they would do something called 40 lashes minus one, which means that they would hit you 39 times. Why 39? Well, because at 40, you were basically declared dead. You're not coming back from that. So that alone killed a lot of people before the crucifixion even happened. And yet Jesus is now being flogged and being hit over and over and over again, first with rods, then with switches to tenderize the meat, and then 
with what we call a cat of nine tails. The cat of nine tails was a vicious thing that the Romans used where it was a rod and at the end of it were nine separate pieces of leather. And on the end of that leather tied sharp rocks, uh, carved bone, uh, a lot of uh, metal or glass or whatever they had. And what they would do is if Jesus was kneeling here, posted up, they would stand on his right side and aim for the left side of his body. Why would they do that? Because as they whipped the nine tails, it embedded nine different places in his skin. And they did it on the right side so that if you are on this side and you ripped it out, it would just simply pull it. But if you're on this side, it rips all the flesh and bone on one side and they ripped it out so that it caused the worst pain you could have. A lot of the times a bone would be shown. A lot of times ribs would actually be extracted out. Organs would be falling out. A lot of people died just from this. And then on top of that, then he was forced to carry his cross. And the way that they uh, crucified people, which is interesting because a lot of people don't know this, is that the Romans didn't invent crucifixion. The Persians did. But the Romans perfected it. They knew the worst way to cause somebody pain without having them die instantaneously. They just thought, hey, if the wheel ain't broken, don't try to fix it. Just make it better. And so what, I, so what ended up happening is the way in which they would crucify people, and maybe you, know, you were here last week or you know this, a, a lot of uh, uh, pictures would show a nail would go through your hand here, but the problem is there's no structure here, right? This is like just flesh and some small little bone, like toothpicks that would just snap in two seconds. And so just imagine a grown man now hanging on a cross and all of a sudden just flopping off because his, his hand would just get torn to pieces. And so what they did is they found out, okay, if, if I put a nail in between your forearm, between both bones, not only does it pierce a nerve, which is incredibly painful, but it also holds a boundary so you can stay up on the cross. And then as you're on the cross, what ended up happening is your feet would be turned sideways and they would drive a nail about this big through your ankle bones so that you are just, I mean, it's a stud, right? It's just going to keep you up there all day. That, that's a load-bearing wall. It's not coming down, okay? And that's one of the things. And so as you're hanging on the cross, you would actually be twisted like this and like this. And your body would begin to sag. And as your body begins to sag, what happened? Well, you couldn't breathe. And so what would happen? Well, then you had to use your strength of the ankle that is stuck to the nail to lift yourself up to get breath. And this is what Jesus is doing. Every single breath is excruciating. Every, every single time he spoke, uh, it caused him incredible pain because it was causing him to use some of his last breath. We see that Jesus is on the cross, but he's not alone. In fact, we see two other criminals with their own crosses for their own deeds in which they have done who are also struggling and in pain as well. And this is where it tells us in Luke 30, uh, 23, starting in verse 32. Two other men... Both criminals were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at them. They said, have he saved others? Let him save himself if he's this God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung and hurled insults at him, Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him, saying, Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered, truly, I tell you, today you will be in paradise. I want to break this story down to two different perspectives. And you know me, uh, if you've been around here long enough, I try to make it to a point where you can remember it. I try to be unique. I, I try to make it uh, sound good, okay? So uh, I worked all week on this, trying to get these two parts to, to help you remember it, okay? Part one, it's called The Thieves on the Cross. I know. Just wait for part two. Part two, Jesus on the Cross. I know, dude, I know, I know, just my brain. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Right. I know. 
Pulitzer Prize is mine this year. I really do think it is. Uh, this is an incredible account for many different reasons, but it is the first and foremost an account of a decision that all of us will have to make at some point in our life. Similar to Paul or Peter and Judas, there are two men put in two identical situations that had two different outcomes. But it's interesting because as you actually read Matthew's account, you read that both of these thieves first started off by mocking and insulting Jesus. They both did. And at one point in time, what we ended up seeing is that at the end of it all, the end of one life matters. The end at what you do at the end of your life actually matters even up to your final moments. It's, it's a beautiful story of God's grace, his mercy, and his love to anyone and everyone leading up to the last moment. But before I get into how this actually happened with this guy, I first want to make a quick pit stop by helping us understand this is that both of these men were in agony, and both of these men who were, who were next to Jesus um, were uh, hard to breathe, and they knew that their death was in front of them. And one of the criminals at the very end of his life ended up using some of his last breath, not just to mock, but to be sarcastic toward Jesus. When he said, well, aren't you God's Messiah? Save yourself and us. And for whatever reason, we'll get to that in a moment, the other thief rebuked him. And he says, don't you fear God? Don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, very truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. You see, one thief was sarcastic toward Jesus. The other thief viewed Jesus as sacred. Uh, one thief wanted something from Jesus. The other one only wanted Jesus. He said, save yourself and us. And there might be a part of your story, a piece of your story or someone that you know is that a lot of people, and, and maybe this is you once again, is that uh, you, you want the things that Jesus gives, but not necessarily the Jesus that gives it. You want the blessing, but not the blesser. Uh, you want uh, the, the, you know, the money or you want the blessing or you want the outcome and you pray and you ask God, God, give me uh, 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 protection, give me safety. Can I please win the lottery? Uh, all those things. And if you do win the lottery, make sure you just tithe it. Okay, it's fine. Uh, right? Like, God, please give me these things. But here's the thing. When you're in a valley, uh, when you're in a storm, or when you don't get what you ask God as if he's some cosmic vending machine, uh, all of a sudden you don't view Jesus as good or great. You want nothing to do with Jesus. All you want are the things of Jesus. Likewise, the other thief or someone else you might know, they just want to know Jesus. They just want to know him better. And if blessings fl flow and blessings come, praise be to he. But at the end of the day, all I want is to know Jesus more. I want to know more intimately. How many times have you seen somebody who's in a storm or a crazy life circumstance and all they want and all they have is the joy and the peace because they know the Prince of Peace, because they know the relationship doesn't matter and what they receive. The relationship uh, is dependent upon who their belief is in. You see, a lot of us, uh, we want Jesus or we just want the things of Jesus. Now, that's just a quick pit stop. But as we look at the story, it's an interesting one because how in the world that a thief who was just mocking, berating, cussing out Jesus on a cross, all of a sudden now have a place in paradise. And not just a place in paradise. How did a thief who was on a cross for his own sin have a seat at the table of Jesus in paradise? Uh, how in the world did a man who lived his entire life, as far as we know, we don't even know his name, how did this guy end up, no, uh, like end up professing and believing in Jesus? Uh, there's three things that he did in three different verses that all of us have to do if we're going to be a Jesus follower. And the first one is simple. It's just he was changed. He was changed. You can't explain it. And in fact, there's no explanation on what triggered this dude. 
in a good way. Okay, trigger's a weird word nowadays. But we have no idea what happened to this man to all of a sudden believe in Jesus. One moment, cussing him out, making fun of him, believing the rest of the crowd, and then to the next moment, simply say as rebuke, don't you fear God since you are under the same sentence. He was mocking Jesus the whole time. But maybe you know this, or maybe your family members know this, um, and maybe if you believed in Jesus at a young age, this might not seem like such a transformative thing. But there was once a point in time, especially if you believe Jesus later on in life, you know exactly what I'm talking about here with this man on the cross. Uh, you can't quite explain it other than Jesus did it. You can't explain the change that's happened in you. You can't explain the transformation that's happened in you. All you could say is, once I just believed, all of a sudden now everything changed. How do you explain that? How do you quantify that? How do you wrap that up in a bow? You can't. All it is is, once I was dead in my sin, now I'm alive in Christ. Once I was one way, and now I am changed. Because when the Holy Spirit enters into you, you might know this, that your thoughts change, your beliefs change, your systems change, your desires change, the lights change, worldviews change, and they should change in the order in which Scripture uh, has for it and has for you in your worldview, in your paradigm shifts. It all changes. And here's the thing. You might not be able to explain it, but your wife sees it or your husband has seen it or your kids have seen the change or your grandkids or your neighbors or your coworkers. All of a sudden, hey, I don't know what it is and I can't even quite pinpoint it other than saying it was Jesus. This man was just simply changed. Why? Because when God grants you faith, you're changed. And when the Holy Spirit enters you, you're changed. This is just what happens. We don't really know what it is. And maybe you were like this man who once mocked Jesus. Maybe you are a mocker of Jesus and Jesus' followers until all of a sudden Jesus captured your heart, your soul, and your intellect. And all it is is you were changed. The second thing is he confessed that Jesus was innocent and that he was guilty. He says, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. A part of following Jesus is knowing that he is innocent and you are guilty. You see, when we believe in Jesus, we uh, confess our sin to God and put our faith in Jesus, who was the sinless sacrifice. Jesus was innocent. Jesus took our place. Jesus is the reason why we are able to be forgiven of our sin. And so this man just simply confessed his sin. Look, I'm guilty. He's not. And that's a part of that prayer that we pray when we believe. But not just that, like confession should be both vertically to God and horizontally to others. This is why we have community. This is why we have other brothers and sisters in Christ. I heard somebody say it once this way. He said, uh, we confess our sins to God to be forgiven of our sin, but we confess our sin to others to be healed from our sin. Because how many times have you confessed your sin to God? God, I'm sorry, I'm never doing it again. Like 20 minutes later, the same thing happens. God, I'm sorry, I'm never going to do it again. Because God will forgive you, but there's no quantifiable accountability to help you walk the path of someone being changed. And that's why we have groups, and that's why I encourage you to be in groups, so that you can walk life together with one another. The next thing we see, and this is the third thing, is he believed in the resurrection of Jesus and the lordship of Jesus. He believed in the resurrection and lordship of Jesus, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. For us being a Jesus follower, it's professing that Jesus died, was buried for three days, rose again, ascended into heaven, and now sits at the right hand of God uh, for us. And this is what he did. A man who was dying on a cross, standing there with some of his last breath, is professing that a man he is dying next to will soon be the king. It doesn't make sense, and yet it happens. You see, uh, when I look at this story, it's, it, it's an interesting one. Because this man, by no merit of his own, uh, by no action of his own, uh, with his last gasping, excruciatingly painful death that he was dying, uh, he used some of his last words to believe. 
And so if I were to ask you, say this happens, okay, I don't believe necessarily this happens, but say you die tonight and you get up in heaven and you're waiting in line and the angel just pops up right in front of you and they look down and your name's in the book of life and the angel were to ask you a question and the question is simple. How did you get here? What would your answer be? If it is in the first person, you've already got it wrong. If you say, well, because I, right? Well, because I believed. Well, because I went to church. Well, because I was baptized. Or I read my Bible every single day. Or I gave. No, no, no. You've already got it wrong because the only rightful answer to that question is because he. Because he gave me life. This guy, uh, you know, there, there's a pastor once who said this, and I'm, I'm kind of like uh, uh, paraphrasing, but he goes, I, I just can't wait till I get to heaven one day so I can find that thief on the cross. And I can go up to him and tap him on the shoulder and simply say, hey, like, how did you do it? Like, you made it. You did it. How'd you do it? And he just imagines the thief on the cross telling him, you know what's so funny? The angel asked me the same thing. You know, I, I get up there and the angel's like, what, what is your name doing here? Uh, and he goes, I, I don't know. And the angel says, well, well, how did you get here? Uh, dude, all I know was I was hanging on a cross one second. And the next thing I know is I'm standing in line to see you. So I was hoping you could explain to me how I got here. And the angel looks back at the thief on the cross and he goes, well, are they let me get a supervisor. And so he walks over and he grabs his supervisor, Angel. And the angel comes up and he goes, what are you doing here? And the guy goes, look, I just told this guy I have no idea. And so the angel supervisor goes, okay, well, well, well let me ask you a basic question. Do you know the doctrine of justification of sin? And the thief on the cross is like, I knew about three of those words you just said. He goes, well, have you ever been baptized? Like, take a bath? I don't... All right, all right, all right. Do you know the doctrine of Scripture? Like, to read? I don't, I don't even, like, what are you talking about? So finally, the angel asked the thief on the cross, okay, on what basis are you here? And he just imagines that the thief on the cross would just simply say, the man on the middle cross said I could be here. It is he and it's a, an amazing story of a deathbed uh, confession, but it's the only one we ever see in Scripture. You see, this man didn't have to get baptized or go to church or give or serve, but it's an amazing way in which God can, he will, and he is able to save anyone at any point in time, that no one is too far lost, that we are to continually, as people of God and soldiers of the kingdom, go and reach other people as well and not think that they're too far off either. But I believe it is the only deathbed confession because even though God can, God will, and God is able, that is not God's desire. His desire for us is to live a full life here and now, to bring heaven to earth, to be in a relationship with him earlier. And in doing so, uh, even if you are a deathbed confession in your last moments of, of, of your life, nobody might not ever know. And your legacy will never be changed based on the life that you live. Because you could live like hell for 40, 50, 60 years and believe at the end, but that doesn't mean the pain that you caused is any better. God's desire is that we would be in a relationship with him. And then other times, people tend to use this scripture of the thief on the cross as reasons not to take their next step in their faith. You see, well, they, well the thief on the cross never served he never went to church. He was never baptized. He never, he never gave. He was never in a group. And so the thief on the cross got him without doing that. Well, then I can just believe and not be a part of that either. That is a gross misinterpretation of the scriptures and you're twisting it. Because ultimately, God wants us to be in relationship with him. God wants us to take our next step. God wants us to do these things. And so I just have to ask you, stop giving an excuse of not taking your next step and start taking it. Is it to serve? 
Well, I've got no time. Sure you do. If it's to serve, serve. It's to give, give. It's to be in a group, be in a group. If it's confession, confess. If it's to be a leader of a ministry, be a leader of a ministry. And if it's to get baptized, we'll get baptized. Next weekend is a great opportunity for we have our baptisms here. And here's the thing. I don't know if you've been a Jesus follower for a long time or a short time. And maybe you think, well, my window of baptism is closed because people are going to think, well, I've been a Jesus follower for 10 years, was never baptized. They're going to make fun of me. Look, we're going to celebrate with you. And if anyone makes fun of you uh, for being baptized, I'm going to hold them under the water a little bit longer. I had a little more violent thought, but I'm going to stick with that one. It's an outward expression of an inward faith. And I just believe that this thief on the cross, if he was able to get down from that cross and lived and survived, he'd be taking the next steps because Jesus would have told him to. And so the decision is yours. Are you going to be like a thief who believed or the thief that didn't? What we know is one is in paradise, the other is now in peril. The second part of this story, we're going to go quick is Jesus on the cross. We see Jesus hanging on the cross, bleeding, hurting, and all he hears is shouts and yells of rebuke from the crowd. And these are his last moments. And Jesus died as he lived, canceling sin, giving life, and being for people. The thief on the cross professes faith in Jesus. With every breath that is excruciating, Jesus speaks these words back to him. Today you will be with me in paradise. You see, Jesus being Jesus gives this sinner, this thief, more than the thief could ever possibly imagine. The thief on the cross asked for some distant time in mind. Jesus told him today. The thief on the cross asked to only be remembered. Jesus said that you will be in my paradise. The thief on the cross looked only for a kingdom, but Jesus promised him paradise. We see that Jesus in his heart and his final moments never stopped caring for people. He never stopped giving people more than they could ever possibly imagine. That is the heart of our God. That is the heart of our Lord. And that is the heart of our Savior for anyone and everyone, regardless of life or lifestyle, would come to submit their lives to Jesus and then follow the ways of Jesus. If Jesus' heart is for people, then church you and I, we should too go after the heart of Jesus as well. If Jesus' heart was for people, then our hearts should beat and never stop for people as well. And now I would like to introduce to you a man named Robert the Bruce. He was the king of the Scots from 1306 until his death in 1329. He led the armies of Scotland in the first wars of the Scottish independence. Robert the Bruce would eventually die from leprosy prior from being able to join the Crusades from, from finally retaking Jerusalem from the Muslim invaders. And on, uh, the, the legend goes that Robert the Bruce instructed his generals that after his death, they were to cut out his heart and carry it with them in a silver casket until they finally reached Jerusalem to fight. And on the night before their greatest battle, the general of the army stood before his soldiers, held up the heart of Robert the Bruce and threw it in the direction of his en enemies and announced, soldiers, tonight we fight for the heart of the king. And every single week during church, we fight for the heart of the king. Every single week, we place on the armor that God has given us in Ephesians 6, and we fight against the devil, his demons, and his schemes he deploys. He wants people to be distracted and detoured from the destiny that God has for them. We fight for the heart of the king as we help people overcome their disbelief, their sin, and their hidden life. We fight for the heart of the king with every prayer we pray, every encouragement we give, and with every group we lead. We fight with the last words of Jesus when he said, it is finished, it means the war has been won but there are battles to be fought. We fight because the devil would want nothing more than for apathetic Christians to stand idly by while those who they know and love are choosing the path of the second thief. We fight because we have tasted the goodness of God and we know bringing heaven to earth is a fight worth fighting. Every time we serve, every time we give, every time we invite, every time we shout for worship, or every time we hand out a new to journey bag, we understand that we fight for the heart of the king because we know that we are 
we are connecting to God and helping each other connect with God also. We fight and we tell the devil and his demons they have no authority in this place because this place is covered by the blood of the lamb. Why do we fight? We fight because our King Jesus fought first. We fight because our neighbors and the next generation are too important to the heart of God to stand and teach behavior modification and not the life transformation that only comes through Christ Jesus. We fight after the heart of the king because it is worth fighting for. We fight for the heart of the king because the heart of the king fights for us. So we will fight and we will fight and we will fight and we will fight because the king's heart is for anyone and everyone to come to faith, no matter how old or how young. And as soldiers in the kingdom of God, It is our job to do exactly as Jesus said. Therefore, go and make disciples. Make disciples in your homes. Make disciples in your neighborhoods. Make disciples in your communities. Make disciples in your workplaces. Make disciples in North Peoria and baptize them in the name and the Father and the Holy Spirit. We fight after the heart of the King because we have given allegiance to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and we know his word never returns void. So Journey, stand up on your feet. This week as you go and as you leave, fight. There's no greater week to invite. There's no greater week to fight. There's no greater week than Easter where we declare the victory has been won. And so that means that you already walk in victory. Be bold and be strong, be steadfast and be all that Jesus calls you. Fight for your king. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. Jesus, may we go out and fight. May we go out and be bold. May we go out and come hell or high water. We are going to fight and stand firm and steadfast because your kingdom come, your will be done in North Peoria as it is in heaven. Amen. You guys are dismissed. Thank you.